Okay, so back back to Jung and Ea. So these 1914 meetings that they were having, right? So they go in and then they 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 are they're getting people to access their right brain. Everybody is meeting and everybody is having all these really positive experiences. And so then 1926 or 20, yeah, 1926, this guy named Roland Hazard goes to Carl Jung. He says, man, I got this drinking problem. And Jung looks at him and what, what Jung basically says is uh, you have a spiritual problem actually, but he can't say you have a spiritual problem because if he says you have a spiritual problem, all of his like psychotherapist friends are going to be like, um, we don't believe in that anymore. Darwin kind of came and Freud, like, we don't believe in that. So Jung, can you please chill out on the spiritual thing? The conclusion Carl Jung came to is that the guy was drinking to experience low grade spiritual highs. So, okay. So Roland goes in there with these, the, Jung says, oh, you're having these low grade spiritual experiences. What you need is to find, uh, maybe you should try going to church. That's kind of what he gets at. So, so Roland goes to church. And then uh, 1934 runs around, and he joins this group called the Oxford Group. Not a lot of people know the Oxford Group. The Oxford Group basically is this like interim group that all of William James, like metaphysics, there's just a ton of this kind of literature being written in the 19. 19- 20s, 1930s. Emmett Fox. Out of it, we have what's called neo-orthodoxy, which is where Christians come in and they say, look, if Jesus didn't say it, then I'm not talking about it. And they throw like Paul and Moses out the window and all that sort of stuff. So then Roland Hazard and meets this one guy who meets the founder of AA. He joins the Oxford group, meets up with this doctor, and then they form another group that's all based upon the Oxford group principles, which were based upon Jung's principles from uh, the 1914 meetings. And then eventually, uh, Bill Wilson, the father of AA, writes Jung a letter uh, in 1961 and says, you may not necessarily know this, but you know, you're the, you are the, one of the founding fathers and almost no one has had more influence on AA than you confirming that, that this is actually real. Kurt Vonnegut said that the the greatest gift that the 20th century gave the world was AA. So you go through the 12 steps, right? Uh, And the 12th step says, having had this spiritual awakening, we endeavor to practice these principles in all of our affairs. So the reward for working the steps, and a lot of people are like, oh man, like screw the steps. I can't believe I had to work these stupid steps. You know, I'm here because a judge ordered me to be here and blah, blah, blah. But what people don't realize is at the end of the 12 steps, there is an actual spiritual awakening where where you basically wind up living on a better plane, a higher plane of inspiration. And that's like a, that's like a promise. The crazy part of it is that it is true. If you sit down and go through the 12 steps, you do have a spiritual experience. And the, the harder you work at it, the more you kind of like put into the program while you're doing it, the, the better the experience is. I'm really impressed by relating drinking alcohol to, to try, trying to have like a spiritual experience. And it's like totally the wrong way to do it, but it'll, it'll get you there and it'll take it does so work. much. Yeah, it works, but it, you know, it's like, uh, it's kind of Faustian, right? you <laughs> What's Great. the price yeah. you're going to, it's depleting your, your nutrients. It's creating a, a dependency. And then you're also getting all of these uh, imprints at the same time, you know, because you have this, this chemical and then there's uh, associations that are going to be created. Like I have fun and then there's uh, there's music and then you, you know, you meet people and it's all ritual. It's all ritual around it. So it's got like all of the components of a religion or, or, or being uh, in a cult. I mean, yeah, like, yeah, a cult. Oh, sort of. oh, absolutely. Huh. I mean, I, like, I don't know about you, but like for me, even now, I, there's a few bars that if I walk into them, man, just the smell of like sticky bourbon on the floor, you know, or like the way that like a lime smells as it like slices the air when you, cause when you day drink, these are the things you get. You watch the, the waitresses and the, or the servers, the bartenders, like you watch them slicing limes or like the way that like uh, clinking silverware 
get clinked together before the napkin wraps. And then you hear the tape when they tape it up. Like these are very specific smells and sights and sounds or the way that like winter light reflects off of the bar versus summer light. Cause winter light is this real kind of thin, very bright white light. It's not this like warm, dense summer light. That's the level that I love being at the bar. All right. Wow. You're like the most observant alcoholic ever. <laughs> yeah. 